Thank you for joining. This is uh, the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation simulation. We are honored to have Ambassador Dennis Ross today, um, who will uh, already inform me that he watched uh, prior simulation, which helps uh, move it along. Um, the purpose of the simulation is to demonstrate that a common Israeli-Palestinian government could make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians, but not only between the Israelis and the Palestinians, but we believe it can, let me turn, it can, it can make peace between Israel and the, Pal and the Palestinians and the neighbors. The concept is to create a common government based on secular democracy, secular principles that would be separate from the Israeli government and the Palestinian government. It would be independent of them. It would be created as a separate entity, not by the Israeli government or the Palestinian government. It will be created by the people of Israel and Palestine in Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, based on democratic principles with separation between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches. All of these branches will be equal to Israelis and Palestinians. And like I said, it would be separate from the Israeli and the Palestinian government. My name is Joseph Avasar, and this is my email, josephavasar at gmail.com. If you go to our website, which is in three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and English, you will be able to read the constitution. So if you go to the English portion, you'll see the, how the constitution is framed, that it's a separate government for the people of Israel and Palestine together, separate from the Israeli and the Palestinian governments, that it would be a secular government with three branches, the executive, the legislative, the legislative is the parliament, the executive is the president and the vice president, and a judicial, like I said, all equal to Israelis and Palestinians, and its, its entire purpose is to make peace. So that it is understood, we are not uh, considering, we are not uh, um, suggesting the dismantling of the Israeli or the Palestinian government. We are saying a common government could work together with the Israeli and the Palestinian government in competition with them. So whoever has the dog barking, please uh, mute yourself. Um, so it would be in competition with the Israeli and the Palestinian government, but the competition is a good competition, a competition to make peace. Um, you can also go to the frequently asked questions, which explains the constitution in a more question and answer uh, format. Today we have Ambassador Dennis Ross. Ambassador Dennis Ross played a leading role in shaping US involvement in the Middle East peace process, dealing directly with the parties as the U.S. pointman on the peace process in both the George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton administration. He served two years as special assistant to President Obama and National Security Senior Director for the Central Region and a year as special advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. In his book, The Missing Piece, he wrote the following. In order to take some of the abuse I did, I had to believe strongly in what I was doing. Even with periodic bouts of self-doubt, I did. I was firmly convinced 
that what I was doing was just right from the standpoint of America's interest because peace and stabilization in a region laden with weapons and petrochemicals was important to us. Right from the standpoint of Israel's interest because Israelis would never know true security without peace. Right from the standpoint of the Arabs and especially the Palestinians because reform in the Arab world and, re and freedom and hope for the Palestinians would only come with the advent of peace. Uh, as recently as a few days ago, Ambassador Ross wrote an op-ed in the New York Times related to Afghanistan, but he did mention several uh, policies that the U.S. should pursue. The second policy is the administration must discuss long-term plan for the greater Middle East with European allies and other regional stakeholders. So that you know, we are inviting people of all points of view to discuss our plan for peace because we believe that we have a good plan for peace and we are asking people from every point of view to discuss it so that on September 19, we have Alan Dershowitz. On, sorry, on October 3rd, we will have Cornell West. And on October 17th, we will have Daoud Kuta. The estimated simulation time is 120 minutes. We will present several segments in this simulation. Some of the segments would be about um, the constitution, actually one segment. And then we will present legislation that the common government could pass. After each segment, we will ask Ambassador Ross to opine on what we have just passed. And then we will go to the next uh, segment. We'll try to pass uh, several legislation and then we'll go to audience question and answer for, uh, for Mr. Ross. And obviously he could make whatever comments he wishes during and at the end of the simulation. And then we'll have a closing remarks for five minutes. We have a short video that explain what the Confederation is about, how the common government will function. I would like to play it for you. It's two and a half minutes, but it explains it pretty- The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has endured for generations. And instead of time healing the wounds, it's only caused the anger to fester and the violence to grow. But what if there was a way to alleviate the tension? Something that may not outright solve every problem, but at least create a forum that encourages a peaceful compromise. Welcome to the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, a common third government between the Israeli and Palestinian citizens, specifically designed to foster peace, tolerance, and economic prosperity between the two nations. Here's how it works. First off, both Israel and Palestine will keep their respective governments. Israelis Knesset and the Palestinian National Authority will remain unchanged. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, IPC, will be a third entity acting as a unifying agent between the two. The IPC will comprise 300 parliament members elected from 300 districts in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Above them will preside a president and vice president, one Israeli and one Palestinian. In order for the IPC to pass a law, it will require a 55% majority from its Israeli representatives, as well as a 55% majority from its Palestinian representatives, thereby preventing either side from monopolizing the legislature. Of course, the IPC won't undermine the political power of either the Israeli or the Palestinian government. At any time, Israel or Palestine may veto a law passed by the IPC. If neither side vetoes, the law is passed and the two nations are another step closer to resolution. Please help us make this a reality. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. We might speak different languages, but we all mean the same thing. The, um, 
objective of the simulation is to demonstrate how a common government could make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the neighbors. We're not here to have a historical review of the conflict. We're not here to blame one side or another. We're not anti-Israel or anti-Palestinians. We are pro-peace. Ambassador Ross is not a representative of the IPC. He does not speak on behalf of the IPC. He was invited to opine about the IPC formula. We are pro-peace. We have our own initiative and narrative. We do not follow the Israeli narrative or the Palestinian narratives. We have our own narrative. We will have a very rigorous discussion today, um, and, uh, but it's all about peace. And I hope that uh, no one will be offended. And, um, um, and I know that uh, this is an emotional issue, uh, but we will have a rigorous, productive discussion. So that it's clear, we do not preclude any other formulas for peace. We, we say that the formula we are presenting is the best formula, but we believe that a common government could adopt other formulas if they so choose. Uh, in the past, we had some disruptions. Um, that has been reduced substantially. We, been eliminated altogether. But if we have disruptions, uh, do not be alarmed. Um, and if we need to go off the air, just use the same link to come back. But I don't think it's going to happen. Um, we will be proposing, we will be showing the uh, a, um, a constitution and legislation. Just keep in mind that it is done for uh, uh, demonstration purposes only. It is not written in a statutory form. It is, does not have uh, legal um, authority or it's not written uh, in a, a legal way. It is written in a way that everyone can understand. What we are showing today is the tip of the iceberg. We believe there could be a lot more legislation and we do have a lot more legislation to show, but we are limited by time. We're asking you to look at the big picture uh, avoid technical arguments, and also try to suspend reality. Uh, try to understand that we are simulating and our time is limited. We're asking that during the simulation, you refrain from comments. Um, questions are okay, but you can use the chat feature to comment. It's very powerful. Um, I use it all the time when I go when I use Zoom uh, with other groups. It's very powerful. Everyone can see what you're writing, but please refrain from making comments. But questions are okay, and in fact, are encouraged. The difference between a question and a comment: If I show you an airplane and you say, "Joseph, how does this thing fly?" then that's a question, it's legitimate. But if you say, I will never board an airplane because airplanes are dangerous and they cause pollution, that's a comment. Please refrain from commenting until the end or use the chat. Certain facts and assumptions. Let me get to my uh, PowerPoint to help me with this. Okay, so these are facts that I think most of you will agree are facts that the Israeli prime minister represent Israelis only because he's been elected by Israelis only in an Israeli election. The Palestinian leader represents Palestinians only. These are the assumptions that we need to make in order to make this simulation work. And, and the assumption is, are that we, have, we had uh, three months of election, online election. The country of Estonia with nine and a half million people have elections online. So you have to assume that we just concluded the election, that 14 million people with the exception of, uh, of teenagers or minors were allowed to vote. 14 million meaning in Israel, 
the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem were allowed to vote in a nationwide election. That actually 5 million people voted. Uh, 3 million Palestinians voted and 2 million Israelis voted for the common election. That the president, I, Joseph, I received one and a half million votes and I became the president of the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation and I'm the president of the entire area of Israel, the West Bank and Gaza because I was elected. The vice president, she is Palestinian based on the constitution. She received 1.3 million votes and we will rotate in two years. I will become vice president, she will become president. You will also have to assume that 300 parliament members were elected, some Israelis and some Palestinians. And each parliament members represent 47,000 people. Does anyone have any questions regarding those assumptions? Joseph, I have yes, one question. I do. Who are the Israelis? Are they the Israeli Jews? Do they include the Israeli Jews in the settlements in the West Bank? Yes, they are Israeli Jews and they include uh, 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 settlers in the West Bank, yes. But it also includes the Israeli Arabs. Yes, uh, every citizen of Israel is considered Israeli and he is allowed to vote and allowed to run and allowed to be elected as long as they accept the constitution. And as long they, as they do not have a conflict of interest, meaning that they are not part of the um, Israeli government or the Palestinian government. Any other questions? Yes, yes. I have a question. <clears throat> yes. Is this a subversive effort to dismantle the Israeli government? No, it is not. You will see in the constitution, it says very clearly that we are recognizing the, rec the government of Israel and the Palestinian government. And in fact, we give them a veto power over the legislation we pass. Any other I, questions? I have two more questions. Yes. One. Would Israel allow this to happen? Huh. And is there a precedent for this? Well, we don't know if Israel will allow this to happen. We don't know if the Palestinians will allow this to happen. But we don't know that they have the authority or the jurisdiction or the moral authority to prevent this from happening. They do not have the legal mechanism to do it. They don't have the moral authority to do it. And they don't have the technical. But you are assuming that they would want to, maybe you're not assuming that, they need to extricate the Israeli and the Palestinian public from this nightmare that has been going on for 73 years. So the first question is, why would they even try? Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering, is there anybody on this call who is not Jewish? I am, yes, I, I am not Jewish. I'm not and Jewish. I am not Jewish either. But I have I'm a question. Jewish. I have a question. Yes. I'm not Jewish. Can I Anybody ask who is Palestinian? What is the question, sir? Yeah, I'm Shiraz. I wanted to ask you about the dual citizens. Are, say, Israelis who live in the United States or Palestinians who are were living in refugees in Lebanon or Syria or United States allowed to vote? And are they considered part of the Confederation? Uh, because there the are a lot of Israelis living in, in Europe and North America. And they well, will- listen, this, this, this is a common government for the people of Israel and Palestine in the West Bank, Jerusalem and Gaza. Um, 
they, uh, in order to qualify to vote and to run, you have to be a citizen of Israel, the West Bank, in Gaza and Jerusalem, and you have to be a resident for at least six months. So if you are not, if you do not meet those two requirements, you are not allowed to vote. So, but uh, so that it is clear, the neither the Israeli nor the Palestinian governments allow citizens uh, or Palestinians of Israeli or either Palestinians or Israelis who live, who reside outside the area to vote. So uh, the Palestinians held an election. They did not allow Palestinians living outside the area to vote. Israelis held elections. They did not allow Israelis living outside to vote. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, it uh, concerns online voting. Uh, is that, would that, be considered by external players as well as within Israel and Palestine? Would that be considered an authoritative way of appointing people? Would that give sufficient authority to the IPC parliament? Well, that really depends on the quality of the election, the quality of who would administer the election. If it's a reputable, many organizations uh, like the country of Estonia holds elections for nine and a half million people online. Uh, there are many uh, cities and municipalities who hold elections online, but it really would depend on how much uh, publicity there will be for the event. And there will be a lot of uh, surveys done before the election that would probably conform the election results in order to, uh, which would make the elections more legitimate. We don't really know if uh, paper elections are more secure than online elections. We, you know, so maybe they are, but, uh, but the future goes into online elections. Okay, let me go to the, con to, I asked you if you have any questions. Let me ask um, uh, Ambassador Ross, are these assumptions for the purpose of these simulations, are these acceptable to you? And they are just, I mean, look, uh, from your standpoint, this is your show. So I'm not really, I don't really want to question your assumptions. Okay. I mean, but you're willing to go along with those assumptions for the purpose of the discussion. Look, I'm I'm basically an observer who will see what you're doing and then I'll respond with some comments. I'd okay. rather see you get underway than to challenge the assumptions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we are asking uh, some people as part of the simulation, we need a person to be the Israeli prime minister in this simulation. Do we have, I believe, Avi, you were willing to be the Israeli prime minister, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. And we need uh, someone to be Hamas leader. Do we have, um, I believe I, I sent an email to Abdallah Fatah Al Zabin. Are you, are you here? Yes, Abdel? I'm here. Abdel? I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so you're Hamas leader. I need okay. someone to be Israeli, uh, to be a uh, uh, PA leader, Palestinian Authority president. Do we have a volunteer for that? Is uh, Dr. Do we have a volunteer to be a Palestinian Authority president? I can be uh, president if you want. Okay, Giacomo, good. thank you. Okay, and um, I need someone to act as a president of the United States. Do we have a volunteer for that? You can volunteer later. Um, the rest of you will have to be either Israeli or Palestinian parliament member. Remember, we chose we have an election. We are asking you to be either Israeli or Palestinian parliament members. 
So you'll have to make a decision right now. Are you Israeli or Palestinian parliament member? And, and we will ask you to vote either as Israeli or Palestinian parliament member. So you'll have to make a decision in your own head. What are you, Israeli or Palestinian? Um, Mr. Ross, you can also choose to be either Israeli or Palestinian parliament member if you choose. So let's take a vote right now. I'll ask the uh, Palestinian parliament members. Um, uh, no, uh, just change it. Uh, uh, we, we don't have the constitution yet. Can you go to a generic vote, uh, Dan? Okay, just so to test, Palestinian parliament member, please vote. Oh, yeah, please vote. Palestine, those who decide to be Palestinian parliament members, please vote. Okay, I'm gonna end the voting. We have 17 Palestinian parliament members. And uh, let's go to Israeli parla parliament members, please vote. Okay, I'm going to end the voting. And we have 10 Israeli parliament members. So stay in that capacity. You're either Palestinian or Israeli. And um, you don't need to uh, put your initial before your name anymore. We change that. Just remember that if you're Israeli or Palestinian, your district, you'll have to decide in your own head and be consistent. If you are Palestinian from Gaza, then you're in all likelihood, your constituents are 100% Palestinians. But if you are from Jerusalem, you could be a mixed district. You could have been elected by Israelis and Palestinians. So just keep in, just decide in your own head, are you from a Israeli district from Tel Aviv? Are you from uh, Palestinian from Gaza? Or are you a Israeli or Palestinian from Jerusalem? Just decide in your own head and be consistent when we are asking you to vote. Okay. First order of business as a new government just been elected, we need to pass a constitution. So I'm gonna read you the constitution. I'm gonna ask you if you have questions about the constitution, we're gonna vote on that and then we'll go to ambassador Dennis Ross and ask him to opine on the constitution, on what we have just done. Constitution. We believe that Palestinians and Israelis are entitled to equal rights under the law and guaranteed human rights and freedom. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation does not intend to supersede or supplant the Palestinian or Israeli governments, nor to abrogate or undermine any agreements between those governments. We recognize the need to work with the Israeli and Palestinian governments. Our purpose is to resolve conflicts and to expand the relationship between Palestinians and Israelis in a fair and equitable manner. We believe in equal rights under the law, guaranteed human rights and freedom for all. We voluntarily give the legislators and the governments of Israel and Palestine veto power over legislation we pass relating to the sovereignty of those nations. Okay, that's a critical, that's an important part of the constitution. And by the way, this is the short version of the constitution, the longer, the long version is on our website. So let me just, so basically we're saying we will pass legislation, but if it affects the sovereignty of Israel or the Palestinians, those governments will have a veto power of what we uh, passed. We believe in a separation of power between the legislative, executive, and judicial branch um, branches. I'm sorry. We believe in the creation of a secular government for the people residing in Israel and Palestine. 
we believe in having a separate judicial branch relating to the IPC legislation with Israeli and Palestinian judges with a system to avoid biased decision based on nationality. So I'm gonna ask you, do you have any questions? And then we'll go to Ambassador Ross. Does anyone have any questions regarding the constitution? Yes, Joseph, the question that I have is if you could elaborate, the IPC is in competition with the Israeli government. Can you um, describe how or elaborate on that a little bit, please? Yes, it is in competition. There is nothing wrong with competition. Competition is good in every aspect of life. Um, and the competition is making peace. We believe that because we have a broader view of the entire area, but that we are not based on, that we separate between religion and government, that we have better tools, we have better constituents. We are not, we are not exclusively uh, Palestinian or Israeli. So we are, yes, we are competing with the Israeli and the Palestinian government in providing better benefits, peace and prosperity to the people of Israel and Palestine. Any other questions? So could a, uh, someone from Hamas run uh, for parliament, even though they might not believe in everything in the constitution? Well, we, they have to pledge allegiance to the constitution. So if they are refusing to pledge allegiance to the constitution, then they cannot be, uh, it, it doesn't matter if they're Hamas or Israeli or whatever. Every parliament member, just like every US Congress or Senator has to pledge allegiance to the constitution. So whoever, if you're Israeli and Palestinian and you are pledging allegiance to the constitution, then you could be elected. Any other question? Yes. I have a question also about Palestinian refugees. Would they be allowed back in and then they would participate in this uh, elections or not? That would be up to the 300 parliament members. We are not, we are not bringing any substantive, um, I mean, we, in this simulation, we have legislation about the refugees, but in reality, when the, when the common government uh, it, uh, uh, is created, the parliament members, Palestinians and Israelis together, they will have to solve all of the issues and they will own the issues. They will own the democracy and it will be up to them. It's not up to me, Joseph. I'm not, I'm not elected. But I'm not. Wouldn't, yes. But wouldn't this be like gerrymandering where you exclude some voters and then decide to proceed without these voters? No, there is no, there is no possibility of gerrymandering because it really makes no difference how many Palestinians or Israelis are elected because based on the constitution, you would need 55% of the Palestinian and 55% of the Israelis to vote yes. So let's say you have more Palestinians, let's say, in a in hundred years, you'll have more Palestinians. Let's say you'll have 200 Palestinians and a hundred Israelis. It really makes no difference because you will need 55% of the 200 and 55% of the 100 to pass legislation. Any yes. other, any other uh, questions? Yes. Uh, yes. My question is a bit similar to what I asked before but maybe I'll phrase it a little bit differently because I didn't understand before. So has there ever been a suggestion for this common government between Israelis and Palestinians before? Something yeah, I, similar. Okay, I, I apologize. I, 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 I just forgot you asked that part. I did not answer that. Um, look, Basically, when you create a federal system or a confederate system, 
it is all based on the specific needs of the geographic area that you are talking about. So the United States has its own system. Canada has a different system. Australia has a different system. Uh, Switzerland, Europe, Europe has different system. But the principle is remain, remains the same. The principle is to create a common democracy that is, that is uh, uh, allowing or, or separating between religion and uh, government and creates a situation where you deal with the powers that you want to include and so you have to give them some leeways. So what are the powers here? The powers here are the Israeli government and the Palestinian governments. You have to include them. If you do not include them, then you then then you are running, you are violating their sovereignty, and they have a legitimate argument to say that you are that that you are a, a subversive, that you're trying to get rid of them, etc. So the idea is to try to include those powers that you cannot really exclude. In the United States, you have 50 states. We have the, the state of California with almost 40 million people that is in the same system with a small state like Wyoming. It's a big state, but it's a small population. So you have, so you, what do you do? You create a system where you have two senators from each state and Congress people based on the population. So you create a system to try to accommodate everyone so we can all play together and we can all cooperate with each other. It, Any it other just, yeah, it just dawned on me that I'm sure you've probably heard of the saying about divide and rule. Well, this is actually the opposite. Instead of chaos, we want to make order with the IPC, right? By bringing yeah. everyone together? Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. but that's not a question. That's a comment. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Any other question? Um, I have a question. How yes. would the IPC resolve issues such as the Palestinian refugees? Well, we were just asked that question. The, the IPC will have 300 parliament members, Palestinians and Israelis. So they are basically given the opportunity, but the duty to solve the issues together. Because when you are elected as a parliament member to the IPC, you basically say, yes, I am willing to participate. I am willing to work together with Palestinians and Israelis together in order to, to create laws that neither the Israeli nor the Palestinian government could reject. And those laws relate to many, many issues. One of them is the refugees, Jerusalem, uh, uh, the occupation, settlements, et cetera. And we are proposing some of those and we could do that today. Any other question? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Do you, do you have any plans to invite Sadawi, who was a member, Palestinian who was a member of uh, PLO, but now she she's retired. Do you know her? Sadawi. So I, I'm, you, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Do you have a plan to do what? To in, include in your panel uh, a Palestinian who was a member of, of Palestinian parliament and PLO, uh, Sadawi. Uh, she, uh, she has received a lot of peace prize and so on. I, 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 I don't, I, I would love to have a Palestinian parliament member. We have, uh, um, uh, many Palestinians, but uh, send me an email and send me her or his uh, information and I will contact them. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So let's go and take a vote on the constitution. Uh, Palestinian parliament members, please vote first. Do you accept the, do you support the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation constitution?
please vote yes. I mean, <laughs> vote for either yes or no, hopefully yes. Okay, we are, uh, we, I think we have one more vote needed, but that's, we're going to stop the voting for the Palestinians. We're gonna share the results. 94%, uh, 15 out of 17 people voted in favor of the Constitution, Palestinian. Now let's go to the Israeli parliament members, please vote. We, Okay, um, we're going to stop uh, the voting is, and we need to share. 80% uh, of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of the constitution, uh, eight out of 10. So we're going to stop sharing. And then we're going to go to Ambassador Dennis Ross and ask him for his comments regarding the constitution that we just passed. So, uh, Joseph, let me just start by saying I, I very much respect the spirit in which you're doing this. Uh, it is a spirit of, of openness and tolerance uh, on a conflict that has been characterized by too little of each. So I want, I just want you to know I do respect the way you're approaching this. Uh, you're clearly making, you're challenging, uh, I think, existing mindsets. Uh, and uh, and obviously the fact that the conflict has gone on so long and efforts to resolve it at this point have none of which have succeeded uh, provides a basis I think to challenge existing mindsets. As I look at this, probably the most realistic part of it uh, is this notion that you're in effect not explicitly but certainly implicitly and maybe not so implicitly because of the language related to the sovereignty of the two nations. This really is based on a premise of, of two states for two peoples. Uh, hence uh, the reference to the word sovereignty of those, of those nations. And I don't think there can be any outcome that doesn't somehow respect that simply because you have two national identities. Uh, and the idea that you're gonna create in one state uh, coexistence of two separate national identities belies the experience in the Middle East where every state that has more than one identity, national, sectarian, or tribal, is pretty much at war with itself or is paralyzed. So I think that's the, the hopeful part of this. I think it is uh, as a kind of intellectual exercise, a theoretical exercise, uh, this, is a, this is interesting. Uh, the problems you're gonna face are, are practical problems. Uh, and it's not just the issues that were mentioned like refugees, what happens, for example, on the issue of military insecurity? Uh, if the Israeli government sees that there is a, a threat from the outside, uh, is it allowed to act against that threat? Or does this overarching parliament, does it have some ability to affect that? Now, presumably it doesn't because of the way you've set it up where the 55% vote is required of both the Israelis and the Palestinians for anything to pass. So presumably this would not preclude that, but I raise that just as a very practical issue. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, because as I said, I think, it, look, in the laboratory, you can, you're constructing something, whether it can be translated from the laboratory uh, to reality, that's a different issue. Okay, um, so let's, so what would you say is the first, uh, the, 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 the Israeli would be concerned about security? Absolutely. Okay. That would so, be the starting point. I mean, so let's okay. try to, um, so let's try to uh, pass legislation now to give them a veto power over our legislation, and hopefully that would um, uh, assure them 
that they have a very strong safety valve. So this is the declaration of intent to grant a veto power. The Confederation is the government of the entire population of Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. We hereby bestow a veto power relating to legislation affecting sovereignty to the following. The government of Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. Does anyone have any question regarding this veto power that we, we just been elected, we are giving to the Israeli government because, and the Palestinian government and Hamas government, because they are concerned about security and they need some safety valve. In other words, whatever we pass, they can veto if it affects them. Does anyone have any questions on that? Well, Joseph, uh, as an uh, elected pr uh, prime minister, Israeli prime minister, let's say if I would be Barack, I would take the legislation as it was. If uh, as the current uh, Bennett, I wouldn't take the legislation. I will, I will put a veto on it. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, you have no veto over it. We, this, is, this declaration by itself does not affect your sovereignty. It, the I mean the one before. I mean the one before. The one before was a constitution. It does not affect the, our sovereignty. Okay, yeah. We have not yet. Given, we can pass this legislation. Okay. Without asking for your uh, good argument. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, does anyone have any questions? My question would be: What's the role of? Uh... I mean, the veto power is fine, but if it involves um, violating basic human rights, then that is not should not be allowed. Like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, including the rights of refugees to return to their homes and lands. Okay, are you a Israeli or Palestinian parliament member? Neither. I consider myself a human being. Okay, so you, you do not have a right to vote on this declaration. But, and, and you didn't really ask a question, you made a comment. My, does anyone have any question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Why do we need a veto? Because if, if this state uh, federation comes into existence, it will mm -hmm. be in agreement with the neighboring countries to come and recognize them as well as have a peace agreement with the neighbors, like we are having uh, Israelis. What having... is your question, sir? So my question is, why do we need the veto if the neighboring countries are all supporting the Federation? Well, we need the veto because of what you just heard from Ambassador Ross, that the Israeli government would be very concerned about security. And it would be very concerned about our government competing with their government. So we are saying, well, we are not in competition in terms of sovereignty. We are giving you, if you are not happy with the, with the uh, legislation we pass, we are giving you a veto power. We're also giving it to the Hamas and we're also giving it to the Palestinian Authority. We're giving to everyone because we say we can pass legislation that would be acceptable to everyone and would make peace and prosperity. So let's take a vote. This is for the parliament members only, Palestinian parliament members. Do you support a declaration or intent to grant a veto power? Palestinian parliament members only. Joseph, I have a question. Uh, this is Cleo speaking. Uh, so would the sanctions for Gaza be removed in this case then? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Uh, would the sanctions on Gaza be removed? Well, it, 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 we haven't passed that part, but yeah, hopefully we... So you want to know what's happening with Gaza. What are we going to deal with Gaza, correct? Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that next. We'll pass legislation on Gaza. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, can you end the publish the results? 75% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of giving veto power to all three entities. 
to the government of Israel, the Palestinian and the Hamas. Uh, let's go to the Israeli parliament members, please vote. Okay, let's end the polling. Share the result. 56% just passed Israeli parliament members were willing to give a veto power to all three governments. So we all agreed to give a veto power to the uh, uh, um, Israeli and the Palestinian and the Hamas leaders, a veto power to the Hamas government. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Dennis Ross, uh, do you have any comments regarding this uh, declaration of intent, which just passed? Well, the main comment would be uh, veto power for everybody may ensure paralysis. So I understand the, the, the veto power, again, is consistent with what you had in the Constitution, which is, is which says that no legislation can be adopted that would challenge the sovereignty of each of these of these actors. Now, of course, there is, uh, if these, there's a presumption here. The presumption is that if all three of these actors could, could agree to this, uh, could agree to what you're suggesting, we probably already have peace. Uh, the gaps between Israel and the PA are one thing, the gaps between the PA and Hamas are another, the gaps between Israel and Hamas are even another. So, you know, if, if the circumstances have changed to the point where what you have in mind becomes possible, we've already changed the situation from what it is. Uh, so that's, I mean, my comment again is sort of highlighting uh, the difficulty of taking what is, what are the theoretical possibilities and seeing them translated into practicality. Uh, if the, you know, the, a mutual veto system built into the system increases the high, high probability of stalemate or paralysis, unless the motivation that is governing all the actors is to work out their differences. So what this presumes is there is that kind of motivation. And obviously so far, that's not a motivation that exists today. Uh, but we are a separate government. We are not the Israeli nor the Palestinian government. Uh, sh and so we are basically uh, uh, working under a completely different narrative. But Joseph, so let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. How does this government get formed? Who forms it? Okay. Good question. So do we, let's go to the next. So I need someone to be the president of the United States. I need um, uh, European, if we have, and Russian. Okay, but here is the next legislation regarding funding. Financial Foundation for the IPC. We are applying to the World Bank and other countries and international organization for a five-year $100 billion grant commitment to create a solid financial backing in order to implement the IPC's vision and its legislation in the next five years. We will provide full financial transparency directly related to proof of success. Uh, usually in the uh, simulations, we have people who act as American president, uh, European, World Bank, but we are still, let's take a vote on that. Does anyone have any question regarding this financial foundation for the IPC? No question. Let's have the Palestinian parliament members vote. Remember, we elected 300 parliament members. Okay, let's stop the uh, Palestinian vote.
share the results. 92% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of this financial foundation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. <clears throat> Let's stop the sharing. They share the results. 80% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of this. So basically, can we stop the... Uh, to answer your question, Ambassador Ross, we believe that if we have an election and if we, if you assume what we assume that 5 million people voted and 300 parliament members are elected, we will be able to get the funding from the World Bank and world governments and other organizations for us to operate. Um, now, that's a question of vision. You may disagree with this vision or not, um, but uh, so you may ask us, what are you going to do with that money? So let's go to what the lady asked, the parliament member. I, I, I don't know if she's Israeli or Palestinian, but let's go to Gaza. So this is the legislation for a joint economic zone, Israel and Gaza. Joint economic zone between Israel and Gaza, exclusive IPC management and control, uh. common economy, education, industry, agriculture, sewer treatment, desalination plants, solar farms, wind powers, and green energy international airport and seaport, equally accessible to the Israeli and the Palestinians. So here, uh, here we're gonna give a veto power because this affects the sovereignty. So does anyone have any questions regarding this legislation? Does, does a veto uh, need uh, just a majority, let's say in the Israeli Knesset, just a majority or what, what does a veto mean from each of the sides. It would be up to the Knesset to decide how they want to vote on that to veto it. We don't, we don't control the Israeli Knesset. We are a separate government. They will have to vote based on their laws. And it would be the executive branch of the Israeli which is the, the, the prime minister. Any other questions? Yeah, I do have a question. I actually have a couple of questions, but I just want to start with one. Um, where, you know, the, the Palestinian Authority, at least as of today, would probably oppose this because it would mean Hamas is a beneficiary of this. You take that into account or you don't take it into account? Oh, we do. We do take that into account. In fact, we have, th this was Ambassador Ross asking that question. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we have a, 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 another uh, legislation. Um, converting Kalanga Checkpoint into Education and Commerce Center as well. So, um, but let's see if uh, the uh, um, if the uh, um, uh, the Palestinians uh, veto this, but let's take a vote. Uh, Palestinian parliament members, how do you vote? Okay, let's uh, end the Palestinian vote. Uh, Sixty-seven percent of the Palestinian parliament voted in favor of this. Let's go to the um, Israeli parliament members, please vote. Let's end the voting of the Israeli. 83% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of this. Uh, so now let's go to the Israeli prime minister. Mr. Prime Minister, are you going to veto this legislation? Well, if we came so far, I wouldn't. Okay. 
Um, what about the uh, Hamas leader? Mr. Hamas leader, are you going to veto this legislation? I will not veto this legislation. I, you know, with, with the premise that you know the, the the constitution is you know passed that like everybody is equal. We have equal rights in, in for all people who are living in this, uh, you know, under the uh, IPC. So I think it's uh, you know and uh, like maybe see on the face of it, I know I don't I cannot you know veto this. But the thing is like you know what what about the details? Who's going to be like managing this? Uh, um, joint economic zone. Is it IPC? Or yeah, it's, it's exclusively under our control. Okay, all right. Okay, Fine. let's go to the. Um, uh, can I ask one more, Joseph? Can I ask one more question? Sure, sure. Because I, I presume that the, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister probably has this in mind. Does this assume that Hamas is not building tunnels and is not uh, building rockets and the like? Uh, this this legislation is stands on its own. It doesn't have any assumptions uh, regarding either the Israelis or Hamas or the Palestinians' behavior. But Joseph, I have to 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 take it for granted because that's why I said if we came so far, then yes. Uh, I mean, if, if it's still a, a war zone, it won't take place. Of course, there will be a veto. So I guess we get we are we are further with our will towards each other. Then it will take place. Then it's wonderful if it takes place. Okay, let's talk to the Palestinian Authority president. Yes, um, I have a question because uh, I see all these good benefits for the Gaza Strip, uh, and that's fine. And it's, I'm glad that the Palestinian people uh, would benefit from this. However, my, my uh, area of jurisdiction does not seem to be uh, benefiting directly from, from, these, uh, from these facilities that are being uh, envisaged. So I, I, I'm in favor of it, and I would not uh, impose a veto as long as I heard that there's a prospect for similar initiatives happening in my territory. So in in the, in the West Bank. So um, uh, I don't know if you have any comments about this. Well, we are not here to resolve your difficulties with Hamas. We believe that you always said that you are the president of the Palestinian people in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. So uh, if you want to um, uh, to have uh, to establish your government strongly or if Hamas won, that's between um, between you. But we are the government of Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. We are we want to benefit the people of Israel and West Bank and Gaza. We recognize your power. We appreciate uh, your issues and we understand that uh, we gave you an opportunity to veto. You did not veto this legislation. Presumably because you are concerned about the Palestinian people in Gaza. And so we appreciate your lack of veto. And, um, and, and, and now we're going to go into another legislation, if possible. One more legislation. We have a lot. Declaration of Peace. Our goal is to be a shining example for peace and tolerance. We believe in the respect of, for all people, regardless of religion or gender. We are committed to protect all people of all religions and to value the sanctity of life. All people are equal. All religions are equal. The practice of religion is voluntary and shall not be imposed. We respect the connections of all religions to the land and no war shall be imposed on the count of religion. We encourage all governments of the world to adopt this resolution. Do we have questions regarding this um, declaration of peace? Hearing no declaration, let's hear from these Palestinian parliament members. Do you support this declaration? 
Palestinian parliament members. Okay, let's share the vote. 100% of the Palestinian parliament members voted yes. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. And then we'll go to Mr. Ross. And then we'll go to question and answers. Let's share the vote. 82% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of this declaration. Okay, let's uh, end the polling. And let's go to Mr. Ross to hear his comments regarding our declaration of peace. It's, I think it's hard to, to question or challenge this. This is, of course, these are broad principles of peace and tolerance. Uh, that, you know, should be embraced. All right. Thank you. So let's go to, um, I'm going to stop sharing and let's have the, um, the um, uh, participants uh, ask questions of Mr. Ross. Do we have any? Okay. I would like to have a question and Mr. Ross. Uh, because it seems, Mr. Ross, that you are, you are still in favor of two states uh, uh, solution, which will be also a situation that's similar here. Uh, and I'm sure that is, as now, if I would be Barack, I will be very uh, embracing it. My question, if it's up to date, why the U.S. government is still uh, trying to reach something like that, which is at the moment doesn't look at all as possible? Um. Well, I think they look, the reason is that the alternatives are seen as worse. Uh, and so I think the position is one in which, how do you preserve two states as a possibility when the likelihood of achieving it in the near term is low? So what has to happen uh, to create a different set of circumstances or conditions to increase the probability for later on if you can't, if you can't produce it today? The Biden administration's position is still a commitment to two states. The question one could ask is, what are the steps they're taking to try to preserve that as an option uh, at a time when the level of disbelief among Israelis and Palestinians is so high? OK, let's go to Libby. Uh, hi, uh, Dennis Ross. Nice to see you again after 20 years. Um, I noticed that in the beginning, when you uh, made your opening comments, you used the phrase that uh, this exercise seemed to be challenging existing mindsets, uh, which I agree is the big challenge we all face today because we are so used to hearing the same um, hopes expressed and nothing changes. So I'm wondering, uh, again, like the other gentleman just mentioned, the two states it seems to me that the two-state solution has been dead for quite some time and that it is time to challenge our old mindsets and to think about something new. And I wonder if you feel that this is the time and, it, and if something like this leads us into a new possibility for working through issues that have been stopped uh, cold for 70 plus years. I guess what I would say is that there, precisely because we haven't succeeded, uh, there is value in asking some basic questions, but those questions need to be posed of other alternatives as well. I mean, when you make foreign policy in general, you rarely have choices that are, uh, that are binary, meaning one is a good choice and the other is a bad choice. What you typically are left with is What's the least of the bad choices that we have and how do we act on them? Uh, so I, yes, I still subscribe to two states for two peoples because as I said, you have two national identities uh, and the idea that these two national identities are gonna coexist comfortably in one state, there are very few precedents for that anywhere. And in the Middle East, there's none. So to think that what hasn't worked in the Middle East will suddenly work here, I think is hard. But having said what I just said, I think we should be challenging ourselves and, and at least 
look at other alternatives. And when you look at the other alternatives, maybe you come back and you say, you know what? Uh, they don't work either. So we have to come back and, and be better at trying to get this one done. So, uh, you know, why am I spending two hours on a Sunday on something like this? I obviously don't need to be doing this on a Sunday because I want to challenge myself. I want to, I want to question assumptions. I want to be forced to think about things. I presume that's why people are joining this as well. So, you know, do, do I embrace this? No, but am I listening? Am I thinking about it? Yes. Uh, let me ask a question. The U.S., the key to the U.S. success in putting together 350 million people with different nationalities and different religions and is the separation between government and religion. The principle that we are proposing is the same principle. So why would you not accept that principle for Israel and Palestine, but you would accept it, I presume, for the United States? Well, first, they're not the United States. And we can't simply assume we can impose what our values are, number one. But number two, look, do I, would I love to see the principle of separation of church and state? Of course. I mean, I, the, the declaration of peace and the, the, the peace that you, you outlined, peace and tolerance is based on the respect of the other. Uh, and if, if you make, you know, without that separation, it becomes much harder to achieve it. But I would ask you, you were promoting what is an ideal. And I said, I very much respect that idea. Now, Israel is a state of the Jewish people. If you ask the Palestinians, are they so keen to separate religion and state? I'm not sure. I certainly know where Hamas comes from, but I would even say the PA itself wouldn't find it so easy to do that. So again, what you're doing, Joseph, is you're challenging a lot of assumptions. And maybe those assumptions, on the one hand, I'm saying I think they deserve, questions about them deserve to be raised. The ability to take this and translate it into a real life political reality, uh, I think is going to be enormously difficult. Uh, but okay. but well, everything we've done so far has been enormously difficult as well. We have a lot of people at raising their hands. So let me sure. give the order of the question. We'll start with Janine, Nidal, Ilan, Abed, Warda, and Hamde. So let's start with Janine. Okay. Um, and please ask short questions because we have a lot of people. Okay. My question is in this simulation, we probably don't have time, but in another simulation, can we go over things that concern world? Uh, the, not just the financial economy, but the ecology, the, what has to do with things that affect everybody on the planet, to do with um, climate change, for example, deforestation, all sorts of catastrophes uh, that have to do with us reducing carbon footprint or uh, all, all sorts of things. So my question is, can we have uh, a simulation that asks questions about these joint working together on uh, things that, like wind power, we, we mentioned it today, but Janine, we didn't the question is, on the, it. We yeah. need to ask the question of Ambassador Ross. In other words, does Ambassador Ross think that these things can be better achieved if we join forces together rather than separately? That's the question. Okay, that's a good. Well, I'll, I'll answer it very briefly. Um, we have so many issues that don't respect borders. You mentioned ecology and climate change. 
if there is an issue that doesn't respect a border, that's it. What about health pandemics, which we've, we've experienced in almost the last year and a half now? I'm afraid it's not going to be the last one. No individual country can solve either climate change or health pandemics on their own. So clearly, when it comes to these kinds of challenges, which affect everybody, if we can't come up with more collective solutions, we'll have no solutions at all. Okay, let's go to Nidal. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Joseph, for holding this meeting. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Ross, for being here. And actually, I uh, happen to agree with Mr. Ross that I'm a pro to state solution. I still think it's the best solution we have. As the saying goes, the two-state solution is a bad solution, except for all the other options. My question to Mr. Ross is, since you have been very involved in the negotiation for two-state solution for a few decades, please educate us about what happened. Why don't we have this solution uh, now? Why don't we have two states now? What was the United States role? Was it neutral or not? What was your role personally? I think you personally was one of the reasons why we don't have two states. I think thousands of people died on both sides because of your non-neutral position in those talks. I did read your books and I did read books about the negotiations for two decades. And I know as a fact that you are not neutral. You are always pro-Israel pro and you are biased. Nida, you are can you ask a question, question please? Yes, my question is, you were pro-Israel, more Israeli than the Israelis themselves. Even the Israeli government accepted position that you yourself withheld from the Palestinians. Why did you intervene and undermine the uh, George Mitchell uh, involvement in the two-state solution? Do you feel guilty? And what do you think you and the United States can do to educate us now? What happened, what happened wrong and how we can fix it to come to a real two-state solution. Thank you. Well, obviously, Nadal, uh, I reject your characterization of my role. Uh, the fact is I got criticized by both sides, not just by one side. Uh, if you go back and you look at the Clinton parameters, which I was the principal drafter of, they were an attempt to bridge the positions of the two sides. I'd suggest you go back and take a look at those. Uh, when we presented those in December of the year 2000, what they reflected was uh, having heard everything from both sides, having been intensively involved in the negotiations, and these were the most intensive negotiations ever. This was basically a fundamental bridging position between the two, between the two sides. Now, we didn't turn down the Clinton parameters. The Barack government didn't turn down the Clinton parameters. Yasser Arafat chose to turn down the Clinton parameters. And I can tell you, I had a, a dinner in Rawabi with one of the Palestinian negotiators who told me, and this was, this was 18 months ago, he told me the whole Palestinian delegation that received those parameters on December 22nd, the year 2000, they all wanted to accept the Clinton parameters. Arafat chose to reject them. And the person I was meeting with said to me, can you imagine where we would be had we accepted them in the year 2000? You know, there won't be peace until both sides can basically make fundamental adjustments. You know, the essence of compromise is mutual adjustment. So if you look at what is necessary from a two state or two people standpoint, fundamentally, you know, each side has basic needs. You're not going to work this out until both sides' needs are met. You talk about the lack of neutrality. What The way you measure a broker is not whether they have a relationship with one side or the other. You know, the, the notion of being completely neutral, anyone who's, who's completely neutral probably doesn't have much of a stake uh, in the conflict resolution. The reality here is that there's no agreement unless the needs of both sides are met. What you need is an effective broker, not a neutral broker. And anyone who is an effective broker understands if you meet the needs of only one side, 
there can be no agreement. And I would suggest that if you go back and you actually look at what I proposed, it was a very clear effort to meet the needs of both sides, not of only one side. Okay, let's that's, go that's what's to, needed now. Sorry, we're going to, let me give you the order of questions. Ilan, Bass, Abbott, Warda, Hamde, and Giacomo. Ilan. Thanks, Joseph, and um, thanks to Ambassador Ross for um, offering your time today. Um, it's nice to meet you. So let me just say that I'm a national of, of the UK and Israel, and uh, several years ago I completed a master's degree in conflict resolution and mediation at Tel Aviv University. Um, so my question to Ambassador Ross is as follows. I mean, is Israel's ability to fight wars and to um, engage in military action is, is well known? Um, and, and quite renowned throughout the world. Um, but Israel's um, ability or perhaps um, uh, willingness to engage in uh, dialogue with the Palestinians um, in order to try to reach an agreement with the Palestinians is perhaps um, less um, well renowned. So I wanted um, to ask Ambassador Ross, you know, why why is this the case? And um, you know, what, what do you think that Israel could do in order to put more emphasis on trying to come to an agreement with the Palestinians? Thank you. Um, look, I think we've gone through an evolution in this, in the efforts at conflict resolution. Uh, I don't need to tell you that the second intifada killed the peace camp in Israel. Uh, you know, we, uh, we're in a situation, I think, where if you look at the, the way Israel as a country has turned to the right, it turned to the right because it basically lost faith in peacemaking. Uh, now, the truth is, if you, look, if you look at the polls of Palestinians, they've lost faith in peacemaking too. So that's why what we have is we have disbelief on each side. I think the, the smarter thing to do is to focus on how do we restore a sense of possibility on both sides? It's going to take that to produce any meaningful dialogue between the two. You know, so I've, for a long time, I've tried to focus on what are steps that Israel could take towards the Palestinians to address their source of disbelief. Palestinians are convinced Israel will never accept an independent Palestinian state. And Israelis are convinced that Palestinians will never accept Israel as a, as a nation state of the Jewish people. So we have to, we basically have to identify steps on each side that could send a signal to the other that the assumption they make is wrong and we restore a sense of possibility. Right now, um, and I'm giving you an answer to how I would proceed uh, because I think that's really what's required. Right now, I would focus, I would have the US broker at two different levels on the ground I would broker an improvement on the realities of life for Palestinians in both the West Bank and Gaza. I would try to change the realities on the ground so that, in fact, <laughs> it's possible to believe things can get better. That will work more in the favor of the Palestinians because they're the ones who, who obviously pay a higher price in the day-to-day -day realities. I work at a higher level in terms of the normalization process, what you saw with the Abraham Accords, where you basically produce greater Arab outreach uh, towards Israel in return for certain steps that, again, the Israelis may take towards the Palestinians. But if they're going to take steps towards the Palestinians, then you say, OK, what steps could the Palestinians be taking as well that would address some of the concerns <laughs> Israelis have? I think we have to get back to that. You know, if it, if part of the problem is if you focus on one side or the other, you can't get anywhere. So you have to be able to address both. Okay, let me uh, give the order of questions too, because more people, we're gonna go to Abed, then Warda, then Hamdi, then Giacomo, then Mazin, then Jonathan, and then Ariella. Let's go to Abed. <clears throat> nice to meet you, Ambassador Ross. Um, uh, first of all, I am Joseph addressed the background of the conflict. It has been historical, especially it was created uh, last century. 
uh, right now, the U.S. in particular and the European has has been and still are have power and influence to change the dynamic of the area, especially when it comes to the conflict of the Palestinians and the Israelis. However, I it is obvious not only that the emerging new power, China, as, as time goes, the US power recedes, as I see it, and the European, it's diminishing, but it depends, the rate of diminishing power is, I am not an expert at that. It needs Abbott, a could you, Abbott, my, We have a lot Abbott, of questions and very little time. Could you focus yeah, on your question? Uh, thank you, thank you, Joseph. And my question to Ambassador Ross is, this is a consideration of urgency to push for peace and solve this in a strategic way, this conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and hopefully it is one state solution, in my view. Oh, so is your question, is one state better? I believe so. I believe one state is better for everybody. Okay. And it could go beyond Palestinians and Israelis. It could go uh, you know, it will bring peace to the entire region and beyond. Let's have Ambassador Ross answer the question, please. Well, I kind of addressed the issue of one state before. I said you have two separate national identities, and I don't see how they're going to be satisfied in one state. And if we look at the Middle East, we see go around the region and look at the states where there's more than one identity, and those states are either failing states now or completely paralyzed. I don't think we want to wish that for Israelis and Palestinians in the future. All right, let's go to, um, let me read the order because more people are asking questions. Warda, Hamdi, Giacomo, Mazin, Jonathan, Ariella, and Olivia. Let's go to Warda. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry to be late, but uh, it was uh, some uh, technical uh, problems. Uh, nice to meet you, Mr. Ross. Um, uh, according to the agreements uh, that we uh, were all around and we read it and we learn it, uh, I think um, uh, that it was not enough to make declaration uh, of uh, intent for peace uh, by making these uh, agreements, it's not uh, enough to make intent of peace, but to take into account the needs of the two people by listening to one's narratives and understanding and accepting opinions. So, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, so it uh, is the establishment of a confederate state that supports two states with a state on law um that i mean that it has uh, a supreme law that uh, supports equally the two states uh, who can be separately but living together uh, separately to to give every people its uh, needs its uh, Warda, can you uh, please ask the yeah. question so this is the, my question is the establishment is establishment sorry <laughs> of the confederate state uh, that supports the two people under one law uh, under one uh, supreme court under one parliament in the same uh, in the same uh, time every uh, country has one uh, parliament different that uh, all the laws come also from the needs of every uh, country so it's uh, this is my question. Well, um, Varda, nice, to, nice, nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Um, in a sense, I think you're asking: uh, Is the approach that Joseph is is he that he's developing is this the right outcome? And as I said, look, as an ideal, it's very appealing. But it, you yourself said it's not enough to have declarations. Exactly. You have to have what I call the stuff of peace. I mean, that's why I would like to try to build peace from the ground up. You know, I look at someone, someone who I respect a lot is Salam Fayyad. 
And he was very focused on trying to create the institutions of statehood on the Palestinian side so that in effect, no one could deny it. I think there is a great need for institution building, uh, certainly on the Palestinian side. When I talk about improving the day-to-day -day realities, I'm also relating to that. What could be done between the Israelis and the Palestinians now to do more on the ground, to change the effect uh, so that it's not just that life becomes better, but you see the development of institutions that makes this much more believable. Part of the, when I said there's disbelief on both sides, I don't need to tell you on the Palestinian side, there's complete disbelief in alienation. By the way, alienation from the leaderships both in the West Bank and in Gaza. So, you know, there's a, we need to think about how we, how we change what the current reality is. What I think Joseph is creating is this kind of ideal. Whether it can be translated is still in, a question in my mind, but I accept, the, I accept the point that we have to be doing much more. If we do nothing, then the disbelief will become only greater and the cynicism will become only greater and it'll become even harder to resolve this. All right, let's go to, let me read the order again. Hamda, Giacomo, Mazin, Jonathan, Ariela, Olivia, and Shiraz. Hamda, please. Hi, everyone. I love you, everyone. I love, love. I love peace. I love world. Uh, I'm so sorry. I don't need no speak English good, but but Arabic and Abid or Warda, yani, you can see more than what I'm saying. Okay. Abid. Abid, could you could you translate him, please? Yeah, I will try. I will try. I also not have uh, ninety percent English, but it's okay. I'm sorry, but your your family, your my family. World, my my big family. I want peace. I want love. World, all world. Uh, I want peace. يعني يعني بتعرف تحكي عربي. Do you speak Arabic? Arabic. 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 يعني بنحب انه نطورها احنا بنعرف انه السوشيال ميديا هي بالدرجه الاولى هي اللي بتعزز اي فكره احنا بنسعى لها او اي مشروع هلا انا كوني الي بالفن والي بالتمثيل يعني حابب من هذا الباب انه نعزز الفكره بين العالم وتحديدا عندنا احنا كفلسطينيين مع جيراننا الاسرائيلي الاسرائيليين بانه نعزز هاي الفكره من خلال السوشيال ميديا ممكن من خلال اعمال فنيه زي هيك Okay, I will uh, uh, I will translate. He says that I love everyone. I love peace. I love uh, people. I love uh, I love I love. And uh, he said that uh, I'm with coincidence, uh, coexistence all the time. Uh, I'm an artist, uh, and he uh, he asked uh, uh, if we can uh, support uh, our ideas by social medias and by uh, everything uh, that we can uh, do to support uh, uh, the peace uh, that we are looking for. Okay, uh, what's your question, Su Su Alak? I, I understood that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and and right. <laughs> I understood it well. Let's um, go to uh, Giacomo, then Giacomo, Mazin, Jonathan, Ariela, Olivia, Shiraz, and Sean. Please keep your questions short because we're running out of time. Yes, my question is um, um, actually, I, I thought of what Joseph was saying, asking out um, if um, uh, uh, a secular state and, and United States uh, bringing together. Well, I'm, my view, um, you, given my background, is concerning the EU. Would the the European Union was formed 70 years ago, but in the first 30 plus years of its existence, was a, a trade agreement subject to veto power, or every member state had veto power, and over time it grew and it, it came. I think it's much more than just a trade area. 
um, and so my question to Mr. Ross is, um, would, uh, would you see that sort of um, approach as uh, a, an interesting way of bringing forward uh, improving relations between uh, Israelis and Palestinians? Again, I mean, look, the I did. I, you you broke up a little bit, so I I didn't really hear everything you were saying. But um, when one looks at the your, I mean, what I picked up, the the European Union emerged, as you know, out of first what was a common market, uh, and it expanded over time, and then it became then it, in the early 1990s it, it went from being the EC to the EU. What you're suggesting is, could you follow a similar, I think what you're suggesting, could you follow a similar kind of model where you, you try to do more in the economic area first and use that to create a basis for greater political understandings? Um, again, in the theory, the answer might be yes. One of the problems always has been on the Palestinian side, a concern that there's an effort to substitute economic peace for political peace. And so if it looks like you're only emphasizing economic, it looks like you're trying to buy them off, uh, trying to get them to give up their, their national aspirations. So I think, again, any approach, it, it needs to have an economic element because, as I said, people have to have a reason to think that life will get better, that there's more hope in the future than there is. If people are left with, you know, with very difficult circumstances and no prospects, hard to get them to be uh, thinking that there is a sense of possibility. And you know, when there's hopefulness, then you could, it becomes easier to make compromises. When there's no hope, it becomes impossible to make compromises. So I would, you know, I would be prepared to, to look at what could be done economically, but I think you, you, have to, you can't disconnect it from the politics. So let's go to Mazin. Mazin comes here. Um. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, in asking this question, I will take at face value that you support the two-state solution, what you said, and that uh, uh, despite that you have worked for WINEP, and, uh, which is an offshoot of APAC, the Israel lobby. Uh, but to believe you, uh, really, would you be willing to issue a public statement in the next two, two weeks, for example, that actually takes a practical step of supporting congressional law that says the U.S. cannot support countries that persistently violate international law and human rights and thus demand, for example, an end uh, to U.S. aid or at least reducing it proportional to what Israel spends on the settlements. Would you be willing? Because that's an obvious uh, obvious obstacle to a two-state solution, which you uh, said you support, at least verbally. Would you be able to issue a public statement like this that, the, that basically respects inter, uh, American law? Uh, I would not make that statement because I don't think it will contribute to producing a two states. We have a different view. You take a certain view uh, that this is what will transform things, I think it's less likely to do so. Okay, let's go to Jonathan. Jonathan Zahav. Okay, um, I wanted to ask, throughout this uh, presentation, we're giving Hamas and the PA equal footing as governing Palestine. Do you think that it's possible in any format to make, <clears throat> to make peace with the Palestinian people if they haven't even made peace with themselves? I think it's very difficult, so long as there's a division on the Palestinian side to be able to make peace. Okay, let's go to Ariella. This is what I am speaking about the narratives because I think our friend uh, has to know more narrative about the Palestinians to know the Palestinians' narrative. I think so, Mr. Rosick. Uh, let's, let's go to Ariella, please. Thank Ariella you. Marshall. Yes, my question is, hang on, I have it written down. Uh, one second. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Boys. Um, my question is, how did this happen? It um, I am. Do you want oh. us to come back to you? Um, nope. I have it right here. My um, my my question is, um, this approach creates an opportunity for a peaceful and democratic segments in in the Israel and Palestinian population to unite. Do you see this as an opportunity for peace? And thank you for taking my question. Um, well, I, I think I've been pretty clear that I think there's an ideal here. I just don't see how you translate it. So um, I do want to say something else in response to I just saw Maz in this chat. I don't favor settlement expansion, quite the opposite. So you can, you know, we can take different points of view about how you get something done. But if you think that I favor settlement expansion, I've been very public in terms of, ex of opposing settlement expansion. Well, let's go to Olivia. Please ask a question. Sorry, I had to unmute, sorry. I'll try to be short and simple. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Ross, for your time spent with us. Very interesting listening to you. Now, let's talk about reality on the ground. It would seem, as an outsider, I live in Europe, it would seem that Israelis are, by and large, not very interested in Palestinian rights, or not at all. Um, they don't, shall we say, it's not something they, they lose sleep over. The abuse continues, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, in Europe, uh, there are you know, very important arms manufacturers and the, uh, the arms sales with Israel are, are, are lucrative. And um, there was also at the same time uh, an increased awareness uh, uh, of the plight of Palestinians, especially since um, the, the, the onslaught of Gaza during May and, and before that. But one also has to say that there's a disconnect between civil society and politicians. Now, I think, or I would imagine, that the only way that we in Europe, as a speaker as a European, that we could get the, Europe, get the Israelis to change attitude and start considering the Palestinians as human beings would be to condition our arms sales. Uh, even little by little, one step at a time, things are not going to change radically overnight. We know that little by little. Um, I personally am pessimistic, but uh, do you, Mr. Ross, think that this might help a change of attitude on the part of Israelis if they were pressurized and asked to, and if European arms manufacturers conditioned their sales? Thank uh, you. You know, I think at a time when uh, Israel is facing 150,000 Hezbollah rockets, an Iranian effort to put precision guidance on those rockets, Iran embedding itself more and more, trying to get closer to the Golan Heights. Uh, if you think that conditioning, uh, even though Israel produces a lot of this themselves, if you think conditioning what can go to Israel on security at a time when they, when they see more threats around them, I think that's not gonna work. So uh, in answer to your question, I think the answer, my answer would be no. That's interesting. So in other words, things go on and on. It's very sad. Things go on and on. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I suggested there are things that can be done. We okay. should be changing. We should focus on what should be built up from the ground to change the realities. I want to work both at the ground level and I want to work at the, at the Arab state level as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, so let's go to, we have, Mr. Ross, I, I apologize. We have a lot of questions. Shiraz, Sean, Phil, Abraham, and Sean. Let's, Shiraz. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I think for me, uh, US-Israel is like a father-son relationship and Britain is a grandfather. And I think you can see that in the in, in military industrial complex. My question to Ross is, was Arafat wrong in signing Oslo agreement and why did Israel not uh, <laughs> do uh, implement any of the Oslo. So would you blame Arafat for signing Oslo agreement? And what is Daniel Ross uh, legacy? Is it a peacemaker or fruitful 
a supporter of Israel. Thank you. Uh, I don't think Arafat was wrong in, in signing on to Oslo. I think he was wrong in terms of rejecting the Clinton parameters. As I said, you know, they, this was something that would have produced two states. It would have produced uh, real independence for, for the Palestinians, and he said no to it. Uh, that's why, as I said, I've, <clears throat> Palestinians that I negotiated with, there are those who, at least privately, have said they feel that was a, a tragic mistake. They don't say it publicly because I think they are fearful of what the reaction to them might be. But still, um, you know, there was an opportunity and that was lost. Let's go to Phil. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ross, for your comments about the need for peace to be built from the ground up which I really appreciate uh, as I'm an Israeli peacemaker who uh, this year uh, received an American prize uh, along with my Palestinian partner for building tangible, uh, visible peace uh, and coexistence in our locality. But uh, I want to ask, I'm also a member of a forum of Israeli Palestinian federalists who believe that there are possible solutions that combine the best of two state solution and one state into possibilities that would be better than either. And uh, I just want to, by the way, Wada is, is one of the members of that, uh, of that forum as well. And so I want to know if you're aware of the existence of these uh, ideas that are being worked on and uh, if there's a way to send them to you uh, so that you'd be able to peruse them in some way. Um, Joseph has my email, so he can certainly forward them to me. Uh, as I said at the outset, um, yeah, I think it's all of us should be asking certain questions just because what we've tried so far hasn't worked. Uh, I still, as I said, I think we may end up coming to the conclusion that the two states is still the best solution, even if it's, it's been very hard to get to. And the others' ideas, as you, as you think them through, you can see what are some of the difficulties or challenges? So I just, I, I'm very willing to take a look at other ideas because I want to see I, the, the status quo in my mind is moving us towards one state, which will ensure an endless conflict. That's not what I hope the future will be. Let's go to Abraham. Abraham Weisfeld, and then Sean, and then we are going to conclude. Yes, I just unmuted myself. Um, good day to uh, Ambassador Ross. I spoke with you and posed a question previously at the conference at, uh, at, the, at the reconciliation with uh, Libya at the time, in which uh, the United States recognized Libya and unfortunately uh, destroyed it afterwards. I, the question I have is, uh, if one is proposing a two-state solution, then why is it that those who do so only recognize Israel and not Palestine? I know this can be trivialized if you wish to do so, but uh, this is a serious question and exposes that the two-state solution proposals are half honest and half unhonest. Well, I don't, <laughs> I guess I'm not quite, you know, in a, I, I cited the Clinton pro, pro, parameters, which would have obviously produced an independent Palestinian state. I doubt it. Well, Why? Uh, what are the parameters on the recognition of Israel then? There are no such parameters. Why only those parameters apply to Palestine and not to Israel then? You well, see, they did apply work. to Israel. Did, did you bother to read the... Why don't you read the Clinton parameters? Yes, but why do they not apply? Why are there not parameters for the recognition of Israel, like international human rights law, for instance? No, there are none. There are no preconditions for the recognition of Israel, even the recognition of nation state law. What was, no, what was, the, what was, what was the partition plan? Uh, partition plan was violated by the Zionist militias who went beyond the frontier that was designated in that plan. Of course, they were attacked, so they should. They no, should they were not. Attacked. They were not attacked? No, subsequently, the next year, after a year of offensive by the Zionist militias who went beyond the frontier established by the partition plan, 
Then there was a response so there, up there to the green a, line, which was even right. far from that partition plan frontier. You know that. All right, let's go to Sean. Sean, you'll be the last person to ask the question. I guess Sean is not with us. So I'll just have the concluding comments. And um, the concluding, first of all, I wanna thank so much Ambassador Ross for uh, taking your time on a Sunday and speaking to us. Uh, regardless of whether we agree or disagree, I, I'm very, very appreciative of the fact that you came in. I just wanna uh, tell the audience that we think that a confederation could be created uh, by creating a grassroots uh, financial support uh, that we can educate and recruit candidates and share the vision for peace, for common government on, on, on uh, social media. And I'm asking you to continue to support future simulation. Like I said, the next one is with um, uh, Alan Dershowitz. And also uh, tell you that the United Teachers of Los Angeles will be making a decision regarding a declaration on Israel-Palestine, you may want to tell them about the uh, option of a confederation. And uh, you can send me an email, I'll give you their email address. So with that, I would like to conclude. I, again, I want to thank Ambassador Ross, was very gracious of you to come in and uh, open yourself uh, to questions in such a uh, direct way. Uh, as you can see, a lot of people um, agree, a lot of people disagree with you, but I'm very, very appreciative. It's really uh, a really act of um, uh, peace, as far as I'm concerned, to open yourself to, uh, to the uh, public to ask and answer questions. So thank you all so much, and thank you very much for participating, and thank you, Ambassador Russ. Joseph, thank you for the spirit in which you approach this. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. you, Mr. Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. Goodbye mm -hmm. to everyone.